Mac Voices TV is brought to you by PDF Pen for iPad from Smile, the mobile version of the award-winning Mac PDF editor. Use it to sign a contract, make corrections, fill out an application, make comments on a presentation, and much more. It's the mobile app that doesn't feel like you left the important features back at the office. Hi, I'm Chuck Joyner and this is Mac Notables. Folks, Skype struck again. Uh, unfortunately, I just recorded an interview with Jason Snell and the recording went great on Jason's side, audio and video. We got my audio, but my video was lost. So rather than waste all that great material, and especially since Jason is the one you really are interested in hearing from and seeing, I'm going to release it with me being a disembodied voice and the camera just on Jason the whole time. Uh, Jason certainly holds up his end well, so we don't have to worry about that part. I'm sorry because we really prefer the two-camera angle where you can see us both. We had a lot of fun with this interview, and I hope you enjoy it, and we'll accept our apologies for it not being quite the way we usually have it. Welcome to Mac Notables. This is the home of the Mac experts you want to hear from. I'm Chuck Joyner, and folks, our streak continues as we uh, get Mac Notables back up and running to where it should be. For the first time in a long time, I'm happy to welcome Jason Snell of Macworld. Jason, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for coming back. I'm happy to be here, Chuck. Thanks for having me back. Jason, so much has happened since you and I last talked. I, I think the world tilted on its axis at least three or four times. Um, and I thought, Lots of sunspots. Uh, lots of strange solar activity. It, that's as good an explanation as any. I'll take it. It's the solar cycle. I'll yes. take it. Jason, I thought we'd make the first part of, of this show sort of a, a, an update on you, though, because there are a lot of things about you that have changed, um, the, not the least of which is that you actually hold a new position within uh, Macworld. Uh, and I thought I'd ask you to tell us what that means, uh, both from an organizational standpoint and also from a day-to-day -day standpoint. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a new position within and without Macworld. Um, I am now the... Uh, what's my title? I'm the editorial director for my particular division of IDG. And what that means is my company publishes not just Macworld, but also PC World. And we're doing a new site that's launching this summer called Tech Hive. And as a part of that announcement that we're doing that new site, um, they put me in charge of the editorial for the whole company. So now I used to be in charge of Macworld's editorial group. I'm now in charge of the editorial groups for everything that we do, which means there's a whole other staff of people um, who've been the PC World staff up to now. I'm now in charge of them too. Um, and then from, the, from this group, we're going to do not just Macworld and PC World, but we're going to add this third site uh, called Tech Hive starting this summer. So it's a big it's a big deal. There's a lot of responsibility because we've got to launch a new site and we've got to kind of integrate these two staffs a little bit more and define what this new site is going to be and get it ready to go. So there's a lot going on, definitely. Well, that's great. So does this mean that you have less time to spend on Mac and Apple-oriented things or is it just the fact that Apple has grown into a larger world and seems to permeate everything now? I think both of those, uh, I think, both of those are accurate, actually. I have definitely have less time to spend on Macworld, specifically, um, because I'm doing the bigger picture stuff. Um, I realize that I've been writing, with a couple exceptions, I've written the editor-in-chief column and the front of Macworld for about nine years. And um, as of the current issue, I believe, I, I announced that I'm not going to be in there every month. Um, we're going to rotate it through members of the staff. Um, and that that's partially just because I don't have the time to write it every month. And I think there are other voices in there that have got things to say and they should be uh, given the space to say it. And I don't need to fill that space every month. I am So I'm less involved day to day in Macworld, although I'm still involved in, in covering Apple and, uh, and uh, guiding the hand of Macworld. I'm just also worried about the future of PC World and the launch of TechHive. Um, it is, I think, accurate to say that Apple's growth and expansion is a big part of this too. Um, one of the opportunities it's, it's given me is to be an expert in a subject that is has much more broad appeal than maybe it did 10 years ago. And I think when we're launching TechHive, one of the things we really want to do is make sure that the Apple coverage is in there. I think Apple's success has made um, it a lot easier to have a new brand that is neither Mac nor PC because there are a lot of people now who are neither Mac nor PC. They're a little bit of everything. They're kind of post-platform. They're, um, you know, they, they, they're over it for lack of a better phrase, and they might have a Windows PC and an iPhone or a Mac and an Android 
computer or an Android phone and an iPad. I mean, there's lots of different combinations. And, uh, and then a lot of things span across like cameras and the web and, you know, social media and things like that, that we also are going to cover. So, um, you know, I think Apple's success is one of the reasons that I am where I am now doing this. And, and it certainly informs, um, what decisions we're making about how we're going to cover this brave new, um, world of, uh, kind of broad, broad uh, consumer tech using, uh, tech hive. Well, that was what I was going to going to ask you to define tech hive, but I think you just <laughs> did. It's it's going to be a bit more overarching tech uh, oriented, without a necessarily a PC or Mac or perhaps I better say platform focus. Well, uh, yeah, I think I think um, you know Steve Jobs came out and said that we're in the post PC world, and although that's been debated, that didn't doesn't help if your name is PC World, which we have a <laughs> product called PC World. And, and and even on the Mac side, I mean, more iPhones are sold to Windows users than to Mac users. So there's a, even though Mac, Mac World has done a pretty good job of being a broad, uh, you know, co- covering Apple products broadly, there is a section of audience that's not going to read Mac World because they're not Mac people, even if they are iPhone and iPad people. So with TechHive, yeah, the focus is on mobile technology. So it's on phones and tablets. It's on uh, cameras. It's on the web and social media. It's on digital entertainment, audio and video streaming. All of this stuff that kind of spans or goes beyond um, our traditional um, technology buckets. Back in the 80s, Mac and PC made perfect sense as the two buckets to create and put content into. And today, you know, it, those, those, those products still have a place, but they are less flexible at reaching some of the most important parts of the technology world. And that's why we're doing tech hive is to try and find another space that we can bring the, you know, all the good stuff that, that, um, that your listeners are familiar with from the history of Macworld and do it on a broader, a broader scale with, uh, with tech hive and be able to spread our wings. That's great. So I'm just going to have more terrific content. Uh, is it going to be from largely the same staffs, uh, as, uh, Macworld and PC world, uh, contributing to Tech Hive, or you're bringing on new people. Uh, how's how's that going to work? Well, we're not really adding we're not really adding staff per se. Um, it's going to be the same group doing this new site uh, and the old sites. But um, there's you know there's natural turnover. We've had some people leave, and when when we're replacing them, we're replacing them with um, some different positions with an eye toward what we're doing um, across all three sites for this summer. So. You know, there's there's some natural change happening, but what we're not doing is sort of hiring a new staff to build Tech Hive and keep the old silos in place. We are trying to make it so that people can kind of cross over between MacWorld and Tech Hive, PC World and Tech Hive, and bringing in some new people to replace some of the people who've left in the last few months. So, you know, I, I think it'll be a combination. It's going to be some some people who are um, from MacWorld and PC World. If you look on the the beta site that we have up now at techhive.com, you'll see it's roughly half from Macworld and half from PC World. And it really is a, a new thing that um, is a fusion of some of the old stuff plus some, plus some new blood that we'll be having in there. So I think it'll be good, but it's definitely not like we're, you know, the day we announced Tech Hive, we opened up 15 new positions and are hiring a new editorial staff. We've got a lot of really good people here who just haven't had a chance to spread their wings. That's great because it's got to be a challenge uh, with flying the Mac World banner, flying the PC World banner to cover a lot of the things you just talked about, digital cameras, social media. I mean, certainly those are Mac topics that are PC to- world or PC topics, but they're also just general tech topics and even maybe social topics uh, in the broadest sense. So having yeah. a, a, separate, a separate imprint almost to cover those will be nice. Yeah, it, it's... You know, I think there's um, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think um, PC World, for example, has um, done a really good job with their uh, smartphone reviews. There's a woman named Ginny Mize who is um, or Ginny Mies. I've just mispronounced her name. She'll kill me for that. Ginny sits right outside my door. She's been writing uh, phone reviews for PC World for a couple of years now. She does a great job. She's probably one of the ten best smartphone reviewers on the planet, and I think she doesn't get the credit she's she is due. Because um, there are a lot of people who will look at a smartphone review from PC World and say, why would I read a smartphone review from PC World? And it, it could be a great review and it doesn't matter because it's, uh, you know, category X from category Y world. And I, it just doesn't fit. It just And I, that's more psychological than anything else. But I think, 
the fact remains that people feel that way. So part of the reason to do Tech Hive is really to say, um, you know, get let's get that out of the way and just focus on this content and let us be broad. Because our competitors these days are The Verge and Engadget and Gizmodo and even CNET. And those are all names that don't specifically say computer or or anything. They say technology or they say nothing at all. And um, we've put our stake in the ground with Tech Hive on tech. We are going to be a technology-related site, but we want it to be beyond that. We want it to be really about whatever is interesting and hot in technology, um, and then within that cover um, cover products and do a lot of the things you're familiar with. It's like good tips and tricks about how to use this technology and trustworthy product reviews, which is the best camera, which is the best smartphone, and that's stuff that we're good at, and uh, it's in our DNA, and we just need to apply it more broadly. So that's... That's the kind of approach that we're we're taking, but we did have to get out from under that that banner because even if it was unfair, the fact is people do make those comparisons. And if you're doing a Google search, tell me what pro, you know camera I should buy, tell me what smartphone I should buy. Seeing something labeled Mac or PC, you're less likely to get them to to read you and trust you because they're like, what do they know about that? Even if we know quite a bit, the label is just um, it's it, you know it's misapplied. It doesn't it doesn't fit. So that was our challenge. So you'll have an outstanding pedigree coming from IDG, Macworld, PC World, but a new identity and a broader focus. Yeah, yeah, to go with our existing Macworld and PC World, so, yeah. which are not going away. I, I, there were some people when we announced this who were like, oh, well, of course, it, it was inevitable that they, they would kill Macworld and PC World and replace them with something broader, but we're not doing that. We spent a long time talking about what our strategy was going to be here, and it became clear that there is a very specific audience for Apple stuff and a very specific audience for PC ecosystem, you know, PCs and Windows kind of kind of kind of stuff and we don't want to tell those people to to beat it. We love those audiences and we want to keep them, but we also want to add this broader audience too. So we're all we're doing three sites and two magazines and it's going to be we're going to be busy, but uh, it's going to be good. Well, now, if, you must be reading my notes here because that was going to be my next question. Uh, with I know, Chuck. I don't have a camera hidden in your house. <laughs> yeah. or- <laughs> okay. Um, I, I've completely lost the question. Oh, got it back. Um, the magazines. You know, does yeah. this have any effect on the magazines? I mean, we all have seen all the stories. And again, you and I have a lot of catch-up to do. But in, in a world that is going wire- paperless um, or seems to be pushing that way, the magazines still are going to continue, uh, and and obviously the content is going to be MacWorld, PC World content, so it's going to be great. But yep. any extra focus, any reduced focus, any any changes in attitude about the print publications? You know, people have been telling me that print was going to die for ages now, and it just hasn't done it. And in fact, our our print, you know, the way we've managed it, and I am sure most magazine publishers can't say this, but we have managed our print products um, effectively for profit. They are still money makers. They are an important part of our business, and they're not going anywhere. Um, they are, you know, the circulations are smaller than they used to be. That's absolutely true, and that's part of the trick: is not to get in this sort of ego trap of saying we don't want to give up on our, you know, five hundred thousand a month circulation. So we'll just keep printing copies and giving them away, so we can point to this big number. And all the while, you're losing money. It's not the game that that IDG plays. So so print is an important part of our business. It's it's not growing necessarily, but it is profitable, and that's great. Um, I think that the iPad has really opened up a lot of opportunity for magazines to make the move to digital. And we just last month started doing a fully tablet focused version of Macworld, and this month we're doing it with PC World too, where we're actually laying out the magazines a second time, which is a lot of work, so that they fit and um, function as you'd expect on the iPad. There are, you know, reason, regions you can touch and re- regions you can scroll and it's laid out for the screen size and the screen resolution. And, uh, you know, so I think there's an opportunity there for us to actually grow. We've got a lot of people who are signing up for these monthly subscriptions in iTunes where they, their iTunes account gets charged one ninety nine a month and they get Macworld pushed to the newsstand on their iPad. So, you know, I think there's opportunity there and maybe for other stuff too. You know, you'd never launch a print magazine today in the U.S., I think. Um, we, we certainly wouldn't because the cost would be huge and the profits would probably be uh, few or none. But on the tablet, you know, there's some opportunity there to maybe even do some new stuff. And certainly we also do eBooks that we sell through the iBook store and the Amazon store. 
store. And that's not print, but it's using a lot of the same smarts that we have about producing print products and good web content to find another medium, which is selling ebooks for anywhere from 99 cents to $10. And that's been pretty successful too. So it's all, you know, it's all still out there and it, it, it's a lot more work. There's no doubt about it, but to do all these different versions, but, um, you know, they're important to us. I mean, Macworld and PC World are not going away as magazines because they are still a major part of our business. You know, sometimes when we're really focused like a laser on the website, it, it, we have to actually remember, wait a second, you know, we're not going to make decisions that make the magazines um, suffer and be bad because they're you know, an incredibly por- important part of our business too, which is, I admit, makes our business here a little bit different and the challenge different than if we were doing The Verge or Engadget or Gizmodo. Um, they don't really have to worry about that so much. Although, you know, Engadget does a weekly magazine now that's iPad or tablet only that's a summation of their best stories for the week cut down and I think it's a brilliant idea it's called Distro. And, um, you know, I'd love to do something like that with Tech Hive down the road, but um, we got to get our, we got to get the site up and get our feet under us first before we look at that. Really? Now, I, I confess I didn't know that. And I'm sitting it's, here. Check it out. Yeah, I will. And, and I'm sitting here it, contem- it, contemplating that. If well, I'm, if, think, about if, think about it. If, you're not, if you don't want to drink from the fire hose of Engadget and read their 50 posts a day right, for the whole week, at the end of the week, they put together the very best of the week in a little magazine package. And you can get it on the newsstand for free on your iPad. It's a great it's a really great idea because one of the things the web doesn't do well is modulating um, interest, right? I mean, if you are a site that posts 300 stories a, a week, um, you know, even whether you do RSS or you come to the site at once a day or, or once a week, you know, um, you're going to see th- that site's been designed for this huge flow of content every day. So if you come once a week, you're not seeing the best of the week. You're seeing what just got posted in the last six hours. So the web isn't, at least up to now, hasn't been very good at saying, what if I only care about this enough to visit once a week? It's just too bad, is the answer. Um, and so Distro is in Gadget's attempt to say, look, if, you're, if you like what we do, but you're just not that into it to come twice a day or three times a day and read everything, we have an answer. We'll give you this little packet of good stuff once a week, which is, that's what magazines are for. Macworld and PC World are the best of what we do once a month. And we handpick it and we... And we, and we do the extra work to make it pretty. And that's what Gadget's doing with Distro. It's a, it's a cool idea. I don't know how, how well it's doing for them, but I love the idea because I do think that they've, they've happened on a way that the web fails users, which is if, if you can't keep up with the pace of a website, you're out of luck. There's really no way. I mean, Instapaper is actually a reaction to that. It's like before it runs away, stop, stop, save that story for later. But what happens to that story you don't even catch? Because you were sick on Tuesday or you, you were busy on Tuesday and now it's Wednesday. You haven't read since Monday. All the Tuesday stories are gone. You missed it. So it, it's, I, think there's, I think there's something there. Uh, whether that's exactly it, what distro is, I don't know. But it's a cool idea to try and fill a hole that maybe isn't being filled right now on the Internet. Yeah, you're right. With that volume of stuff, that's, that's a good – and it's a good way to say it. I guess it's just one more level of curation or one more method of curation – yeah, not everybody drinks. I mean, we get in the tech community, we really get, um, we, we can be really insular. And we, so many of us drink from the fire hose and we, we read all the sites and we've got the master RSS feed and we're reading everything and seeing everything and our Twitter feeds are full of links and we got it all down, right? There are a lot of people who care, but they don't care that much, right? They don't care to 10, they care to seven or to five out of a 10 point scale. And uh, I don't think we serve them as well as we could. And I think that, I think there's a, a place to serve those people better, to say, what if you, you know, what if you don't want to read about the best in tech uh, every day? Or what if you only re- want to read two or three things every day instead of 20? You know, how do you do that? How do you f- serve that person if you're a website that's also focused on posting 30 stories a day? You, it's tricky. Yeah, good point. Good We're point. not all super intense. They're people who love technology who do not have the time to read all the tech sites every day. So how do you serve yeah. them? So another way that you, you have served for a long time under the Macworld banner and you continue to serve is, is just this, is audio and video podcasts. Uh, do you feel pressure, Jason, to, to move in that direction or continue in that, that direction? Is that a nice way of saying that I'm, I'm on uh, podcasts too much? No, no, <laughs> not at all. In, in fact, Tired of that guy. just, just – <laughs> well, I did notice your Skype message when I – when I logged in, most probably podcasting or something to that effect. 
interesting now. Yeah. Yeah, but no, I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking, you know, again, we have these media consumption devices. Uh, we're talking about the fire hose. Well, maybe we're just creating more fire hose or, or more pressure for the fire hose. But is there is there a pressure or a requirement, you think, to go in this direction and, and create more content that is consumed in that fashion? Uh, yes, but it's different. I, I don't – some of the pressure that we get comes from business pressure saying – we have an opportunity to make a lot of money here. Um, and some pressure comes from sensing that this is the right, the right thing to do for your audience or sensing that this is the right thing to do because this is going to be an important medium down the road. And I think, that, I think there are lots of good examples of companies that didn't do something new and emerging because there wasn't yet a way to make a lot of money at it. So they didn't prioritize it. And those are... Well, I mean, I'll give you a great example. IDG and Ziff Davis, actually both, were the pre- preeminent technology publishers in the magazine medium. And when the web came about, they were like, well, all our money is in print. We can't really make money on the web, so we're not going to invest a lot of money in the web. And then what happened? Well, CNET invested money in the web, and they became the preeminent web site for technology. They're the number one traffic web you know, technology site. And, and IDG and Ziff Davis both missed the boat by not, by making that error and prioritizing today's uh, business, you know, revenue pressures instead of thinking about the future. So, so the pressure I feel for podcasts and video is a pressure from the future, not a pressure from business because we don't make, Macworld's podcast has probably made like $500 in its entire history of like 250 episodes. It's made nothing. We had like four sponsors over the course of all that time. Um, and our videos have made basically nothing too. PC World's made some some more money with the videos, um, but not a lot. It, every, but everybody knows it's going to happen eventually that these are mediums that are going to hit it big one way or another and you can't not be there. That's my feeling is we can't be a legitimate 21st century technology focus with a, with a really savvy audience a media company and say we're not going to do a podcast because it's too much trouble first because it's not that much trouble and second and because there's no money in it today that's just really short-sighted so that's why we do it that's why i you know i do a podcast on my own time because i think the medium is interesting and fun and it's a fun side project to have i do think there's something there i think there's something there with video like we're doing now you and i are talking and i can actually see you which is exciting you know there's going to be something there and our audience is going to find it first, and that's a great thing about the tech audiences. It's like the canary in a in a coal mine for um for media companies. I feel like I hear, I see what's going to happen in the media five years out because my audience is way more up on it than the general audience, and I think that'll be true here. You already see it. Commuters are the number one audience for podcasts. Car commuters, people who are trapped in their car an hour or two a day, they can they consume podcasts, and they're stealing that time largely from radio and maybe also from from playing music, but I think a lot of it is from terrestrial radio, there is going to be a market and there's going to be money eventually. But, right, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a money guy. I'm a content guy. And all I can do is say we need to be there. That's the right medium to be in and, uh, and explore it. And uh, if it works and it's successful, the money men will find some way to make money. They'll sell out advertising or we'll have a subscription or something will happen. But if we let it lay there, um, you know, you already see that. I mean, it already kills me that, that we've got Leo Laporte and, and Dan Benjamin and Mike Montero. And I, I know those guys, all of those guys, and I like all those guys, but you know, they're making a living doing podcasting and they've set up technology focused podcast networks and they're, um, they're building businesses doing that. And we haven't done that yet. And so I feel like, you know, even now we're missing the boat on this stuff and we can't afford to do that with video and podcasting. So, you know, so long way, all my answers are going to be long winded answers. Sorry about that. But this is <laughs> my long way of saying that we're doing it. The pressure I feel is because I feel it's going to be a big deal and I don't want to have missed the boat. Not because I've got some business person saying you got to do podcasts because they're going to make us a lot of money. Um, and, and that would be easy for me because then I'd say, all right, let's do it. And instead I have to say, I'm going to spend money and time on stuff that isn't making money now because we need to do it. It's the right thing to do to explore it and try it. I, I think there, there's a lot of insight in those comments. And I, I think you're right. We've been doing this for a while, but it's still in its infancy. I still think we all are trying to figure it out. I, I think one of the interesting parts, though, is trying to figure out the content that people really want. 
for the most part, I think the podcast producers right now are producing the content they want. And that's not a bad thing by any means. I mean, that's that's what I do, and I think that's what Macworld does uh, to some extent. But trying to figure out what, what people really want and how large the audiences are for those and if they're willing to pay for them. It's, I mean, it feels it feels like an alternative or an analog to maybe some of the specialized TV channels that you see on the 500 channel offerings from Comcast or Time Warner or whoever. Things that maybe you and I might not care about or would never tune into, other people are rabid about. Well, think about the, um, I'm going to go back to magazines for a second and say, you know, we don't have just Time Magazine or People. There are all of these small niche magazines that are out there that serve these small audiences. And and for radio, there has never really been a niche radio market because even your most targeted you know, radio station, you, you know, the, the Latin jazz FM station in San Francisco, right? It's broadcasting. It's a pretty broad audience or, you know, and it's a local audience and podcasting lets that medium be targeted, super targeted for the first time. And that's the opportunity that people like Leo and Dan have seen where they've got sponsors who want to reach this very specific target audience. And you would never, there's no radio state. Leo's tried it with his syndicated stuff. It's very hard to find an audience that is a, you know, super educated, enthusiastic technology buying audience and podcasts can do that. So there's, you know, plus podcasts create a community of listeners I and mean, the podcasts are great and you hear people's voices and that allows them to express themselves in ways that you don't ever see if all you're doing is reading what a blogger or a writer, you know, writes on a page. So there's so many reasons why podcasting has, has this potential and I do think it starts with what we want to hear only because it has to start somewhere. And then you listen to your audience and you try to figure out um, what they want based on their feedback about what you're giving them. And then that's the, I mean, that's the best you can do. And I, I think it's fascinating to see the variations that are out there in, in podcast format. When I do The Incomparable, which is my side project that I just do you know, with my friends at home when I'm not working, and that's a five-by-five five podcast – about science fiction and stuff like that. I, I have made some very specific decisions about that format that go completely against what most of the podcasts out there are because I wanted to try that format. And, you know, I don't know whether it's something that's successful or not, but it's what I wanted to try because it was different. And it was, it was what I wanted that format to be. And, and I've gotten some positive feedback on it and, you know, but at the same time, there are other people who seem to love the podcast formats that I don't really like so much. So I don't know, but that's great. It's a learning experience and a new medium. That's, that's, that's why I do stuff like that uh, as my hobby. I'm doing like more media publishing for my hobby along with my work, which is, would seem to be insane, but I've, I can take risks with my uh, personal stuff that I, uh, that I don't necessarily feel the need to take uh, with my with my business stuff, although sometimes it's great research for for what I end up doing with my business later. Blah. Talk, 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 talk. He he did it again. There goes my note. because oh. the, the next thing I was going to get to was the incomparable. No, 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 let's talk about the incomparable. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I frankly I think I stumbled on the incom- incomparable by accident, and I, I'm a, our, I'm, our I'm number a, one founded yeah. by accident. Yeah, yeah, and I'm a, I'm a huge fan because it really is a different format. Of course, there are a lot of people you and I both know that you have on as guests, yes. but the, each show the format changes, which I kind of like. Yeah, it's you know, so 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 many podcasts out there are magazine shows where it's like, um, and including ones I listen to, but um, you know, there's like a. Uh, it's the news of the week. There, there are a couple of sci-fi podcasts out there that I've listened to. There's one um, that uh, uh, Veronica Belmont does. It's called Sword and Laser, and it's like you know, it's a it's a great podcast. But it's it's like here's the news, and here's our installment of our book review, and it's and and I and it's and uh, like some of the a lot of the five by five podcasts are like that. Here's here's what's here's our feedback where we're going to talk about what what we talked about last week, and now we'll talk about a new topic, and. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do a podcast that was that was much more anthology like where you could pick a subject and talk about it and in a year if you wanted to re to listen to a podcast about that subject you could and it would not be really dated. Um 
and and so there's no departments in the incomparable where we talk about this week in science fiction news and did you see that this happened and did you see this episode of the show from last week instead it's all topical we have a rotating group of panelists which you know basically it, it lets me have a subject and ask a group of people if they want to be on and I can get a big enough panel to have a panel discussion you know more than anybody how difficult it is to schedule um, panel podcasts, right? So <laughs> you get a group of 10 people and hopefully you can get three or four who will talk about it. And, and also I want it to be broad and I, you know, I don't want to do a science fiction novel podcast partially because I can't read a novel a week. Um, I don't want to do a TV or a movie podcast. I want to do something that was broad enough that I could, you know, literally it is things that Jason wants to talk about is the sub- sub- subject of the podcast. And that makes it easy for for me, since I'm him, I can I, – yay, I, it's what, what I want to talk about with my friends. Um, but, but anyway, that was, that was one of those things I wanted to try out was what, what if we did a podcast where if somebody says, wow, I really uh, – I had no idea that, um, that so many people love Die Hard and I just watched Die Hard for the first time and it was great. I can say, yeah, we did a Die Hard podcast. It's number 22. Uh, go listen to it. What you won't get, we recorded that in like December of 2010. What you're not going to get is the news from December 2010. It's just not in there. It's all about that subject. And I wanted to try that. Now, it's these other podcasts that have kind of continuity may actually be more successful because you have to tune in every week and there's a there's kind of an ongoing conversation. And I can see the value of that. I just I just didn't want to do it. And so I'm, you know, I'm learning the pros and cons of that as I go, but I'm, I'm still, I mean, it's what I wanted to do. It's what I wanted it to be. And, uh, that's that, you know, for a side project that people are doing just for fun, everybody seems to have a good time doing it. The people who have listened to it seem to like it. And, uh, you know, and it's a, I've learned a lot about editing podcasts and streaming things live and stuff like that. That's actually really hard. So that was, that's been good too. And that's the way you have to learn is is by doing it because there are no there are no real I mean there's some books out there but there's nothing like the the experience, but I have to say, you're a liter you're a literary guy, um, you're a writer a professional writer and I'm not, and most of the people that you have on there, come from your your cut of cloth, and I have to say that the the, the series you've done on the Star Wars movies has been fascinating, because you've you've given me meanings to them and you've shown me things that I never really thought about. I, I sort of sat down, watched them. It was great entertainment. I, I really liked the Star Wars universe. You guys took it to about 25 new levels for me and I, now I've got to go back and re-watch them and try to look at the notes about, okay, well, what am I supposed to watch here and pay attention to? So it, it, it's, it's been interesting there. I've heard you dissect some novels um, that I, I think is an, also an interesting thing to do. You're right, not a novel a week because I couldn't keep up either. Um, and I've had to skip some of those because I haven't read them yet and I, right. I don't want to be spoiled. Be just timely, right? Is, you can go back, it'll be fine. There will be no news from February 2011. Yeah. Just, just right there. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've, yeah, I've done yeah. that a couple times. Go back and look in your back catalog. That's great, which was, which was sort of the idea. And, and um, I appreciate you saying that. I think um, it's an interesting group of people. They are obviously you know, mostly media professional people because they're people I know and those are the circles I run in. It's included, although it's also got a bunch of my friends from college, which is kind of funny. And it's funny to see them interact. But um, you know, it's, I believe that um, you can sit back and enjoy entertainment and that's what it's there for. But you can also – there's another level when you like – it's it's talking with your friends over a beer about that movie you saw and or that book you read or or somebody like in a book club or something like that where you're like let's talk about it a little bit and did you notice this and did you think about that and and um you know so so getting people who are you know pretty uh they're literate uh they they can string together some coherent thought and they and they get into an interesting conversation about what, what this means or why they did it that way or something that they liked. And that's, I, I, that's cool. My favorite thing about having this entire podcast happen is that these people that I know and like, I don't get a lot of time to talk to them about that stuff, even though we've got those things in common and now we get a chance to do it. And, and that's great. And some of them like books more than movies or TV and we kind of mix it all together and we end up with a, with a nice group, which is a lot of fun. And, and Hey, you know, Dan Morin and John Syracuse are hardcore star Wars nerds. And I thought I knew, and you know, and Serenity <laughs> Caldwell's probably seen those movies thirty or forty times too. I I thought I knew a lot about them, having seen them like ten or twenty times. I'm a rank amateur, and yet 
to to sit back and watch it again and and for the first time take notes while I was watching and turn on that critical faculty, I I noticed things that I never noticed before in like The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And so um, it was great to be able to do that and then come to the podcast and have Dan and John say, oh, not only that, but... But and then reel off all of these other things that I didn't even notice, and that's it, it's been a lot of fun. And the, the Star Wars ones are the ones that have gotten the best reaction, and I think that's interesting because those are like three hours talking about a two-hour movie, and yet people, which which would sound like death, but um, people loved it, um, which is cool because I, I guess there's a there is an audience for people who who want to have that like you know they love it and they're interested in it and they like to hear other people who also love it talk about it and maybe bring some things up that they haven't heard before. It's been, those are the, those are among the most successful ones uh, we've done. And uh, those are the ones where we draft things because that's just stupid and silly and fun. So yeah, thank you. I'm glad you like them. No, I, I really do. And, and I guess, you know, for the folks who haven't listened to them, I, I would encourage, and Jason, you said it so well about it. It's a group of friends getting together and talking about it. It's not anybody trying to be, professional about it it's not anybody trying to be overly geeky about it it's just oh. hey we really like this we're interested and you know so we just take off on it but There's, we, we also just, engage but, some of our professional like you say faculties right right yeah i mean it's it's it, it is a book review or a movie review in a sense or at least trying to write or or maybe writing a not necessarily writing a paper, but it's using that critical faculty that you might write if somebody said you need to write an essay about the meaning of the evolution of, okay, it's going to sound dry and then it's going to turn ridiculous. If, you, if you're told to write an essay about the evolution of the relationship between Han Solo and Princess Leia over the course of the three movies, right? All right. So we've taken a right turn there. And yet some of the best, that's what it's kind of like is starting, you just flip that switch and you're like, okay, I'm going to pay attention to that and there's a moment i just had to submit the incomparable for this podcast award we got nominated for and i had to pick three clips from the last year um totally no more than 10 minutes and one of the clips i picked is from our um empire strikes back strikes back podcast and it's when jan when john syracuse and dan morin talk about luke and leia and how their attitude toward each other on hoth on the millennium falcon and then on um on cloud city uh how their attitude just in this movie evolves and they said something that I that totally blew me away and yet was absolutely right, which is by the time they get to Cloud City, they are close. She like kisses him on the forehead. Um, and John said, um, as a kid, I never I obviously never thought of this. But as an adult watching these movies, it's very clear that sometime between the asteroid field and Cloud City, uh, uh, Han and Leia totally had sex. They did. The, their relationship was consummated. Somewhere between the asteroid field, while Boba Fett was chasing them, probably. What a crazy! <laughs> you know what? If you look at it, it's totally true. They are a committed couple by the time they get to Cloud City, and he's and he's frozen into carbonite, which is allows them to say "I love you," "I know," and all of that. They, they are whether whether they consummate it or not. It, that relationship has advanced so much, and I had never thought of that at all. And yet, when they said it, I was like, you know, I think you're right. That's crazy. I love that. That's just, it's cool because it's a, that's a movie I've seen forty times, and I. I, you know, or 30 times and, and had never thought of something like that before. So it's, again, it's, it is like listening in on a conversation over, you know, at a red big round table with three or four friends and a, and some beer and they're talking about something that they love, which you, the enthusiasm goes a long way too. there. These are people talking about something they love or occasionally hate. So folks, if you, if you want to get us, this is a good sample. I mean, this kind of enthusiasm, but, but just that kind of thinking about things. You shocked about Han and Leia's relationship post asteroid field <laughs> it's just a theory but but details aside because they're never they're very discreet i think it's an interesting idea and who it's cool to apply that level of scrutiny to something like star wars which you could easily just lean back and be like oh it's fun um but it does have this other level that uh i think is even if you don't notice it is one of the reasons why it's been so successful so it's fun to talk about it well, the thing that struck me uh, about those episodes, and okay, now I'll geek out a little bit too, was the, dis was the discussion of Luke and his his apparent flirtation with the dark side, even before it became, you know, it was thrown in your face. Um, the, the 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 force choking of the guard, and some of those things, oh, yeah. which, you know, yes, they're they're Vader tricks, and you just, I, I never thought about it as a flirtation I, with the dark side. And Yoda in Empire Strikes Back is like, you know, you need to confront Vader, but don't go in the cave. Don't go in the cave. You're not ready, and you're going to act with anger. And you know, yeah, it's it's uh, that Luke is a little bit scared. We always think about the end where Luke, you know, 
repudiates the emperor. But in order for that to be dramatic, they have to sort of put him on that precipice and make him think, well, is he going to is he going to turn bad? Oh, no, of course he isn't. But at least plausibly, is he is he going down that path? Is he going to how easy would it be for him to follow his father? And and uh, yeah, it's it, it sure helps having guides like John and Dan who have seen the movie hundreds of times because they've thought about I, I get the sense that they've talked about this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and clearly we have less lives than you and I, which really is kind of sad. I was watching Star Trek movies instead, so you yeah. know, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Jason, I, we've been at this for a while, but I, I would not be doing my job and having you here if I didn't get some uh, prediction or anticipation prediction. of, of WWDC. It. Well, maybe not predictions, but just expectations. There, that's better. Sure. Uh, what's gonna What's gonna come out of WWDC this year? You think it's just gonna be pretty much what the normal stuff, the the roadmap of the OS is for the coming year? Are we gonna see any hardware announcements? And do you think we're gonna see any surprises? Well, you know, the most important thing about WWDC is that it's um, it is a developer conference, and the developers are the primary audience. And although Apple does make announcements, the media are there for the keynote. Apple, you know, dr- tries not. Not to make announcements that are that are developer irrelevant to d- the developers, so uh, that's why I put it. They they are also public announcements, but they're meant to be developer relevant. So details about Mountain Lion that it's shipping or that it's shipping in a month or you know something like that when it's shipping. I, I would if I had a bet, I'd say they're going to have a final developer preview posted the day of the keynote for Mountain Lion, and they'll set a date. Mountain Lion will be out in 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 you know whether it's next week or today or whether it's in July or in June, late June, something like that. I, I think that'll happen. I think we're going to get details about iOS 6 because there's so many iOS developers there. How could you not talk about the future of, the, of, of iOS? Um, those are givens. I think the big question is hardware. Uh, occasionally, Apple will do a hardware announcement. There are lots of rumors there about MacBooks, um, and including Retina Display MacBooks. I kind of feel like you know, that would be, uh, it could happen. I would say it would need to be tied to uh, an operating system announcement that the new MacBooks are going to come out and they're going to run Mountain Lion and they'll be out in three weeks, something like that. And so you make your apps all high DPI capable by the time they come out. That would make more sense than here's a high DPI MacBook Air and it's running, you know, a special build of Lion and it's out tomorrow. Good luck. Update your apps now. You know, and uh, likewise with iOS devices. I mean, they could announce a new iPhone or something. I think it's less likely. Um, but uh, more likely is that they'll announce iOS 6 and that it's shipping later. And then the, it'll turn out that it's shipping uh, when a new iPhone comes out in the fall. But, uh, you know, there's an outside chance that they would, that they would announce something like that. Um, at the show, but I think it's more likely that it would be Mac stuff that would be tied to Mountain Lion. Uh, you know, I don't know though. I mean, the OS is, it is a developer audience and the, the most, the stuff that they announce at the keynote is the stuff they're going to want to talk about during the week because they're going to know that it's going to get out. So you can't talk about iOS 6 and not announce it because it'll get out. So I feel like you can't do that, uh, that conference and not talk about iOS 6 and we haven't had an iOS announcement this spring. So that's, you know, I'm going to come down, if I had to put money on it, it's going to be mountain lion details, first glimpses of iOS 6 with more to come at a later event um, later in the summer, and outside chance at new some new Mac hardware um, that is uh, hopefully keyed off of mountain lion. Also, don't underestimate, if there's going to be a new Mac Pro, I would think that they might announce that at the keynote only because the developers will whoop and holler if they uh, if there's a new Mac Pro. So... You know, I think it's less likely that we'll see a new iPhone. I think that's more of a a, a fall or late summer thing. That's my prediction. I, I almost hope so on the iPhone. I, I don't understand this this I desire so. to to right. have one every 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 six months. I mean, when we all have to sign two year contracts, you know. Right. Please give me a year at least. Right, and that that's been their cycle, and I and they drive a lot of sales in the holiday season, so it makes sense to push it off into the holiday quarter. Um, so I think that most likely what they'll do is that they'll they'll do iOS 6 announcement now and then they'll ship it late summer early fall and that'll be about the time that they're also announcing the new the new iPhone and it'll ship with it that seems to be their pattern now they're breaking a lot of patterns these days but 
that's it. There seems to be a lot of logic why you do it in that pattern. Agreed. Jason, we got to do this more often. This has been a blast. I, I really appreciate the time. and It's just been fun. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. I, I hope to do it more often. I'm sorry it's been so long. Hey, don't worry. I know you've got one or two other things on your plate. <laughs> so, two websites, two magazines. Yeah, there's some stuff going on. Yeah. I got I got a plate as full, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll connect more often uh, as as we go forward because there's going to be a lot to talk about for everything. Oh, oh yeah, great. Uh, is it appropriate to say, "May the force be with you"? Yeah, sure. Live long and prosper, and may the force be with you. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Get all the nerd, the nerd stuff out there at once. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Folks, that's Jason Snell. He uh, is, is, is climbing the ladder at IDG, Macworld, PC World, Tech Hive. Uh, pretty soon, we're going to run him for office. It's just that simple. This is Mac Notables, the home of the Mac experts you want to hear from. I'm Chuck Joyner, and we will be back. Thanks for listening. Voices TV is part of the Mac Voices Group and a member of Mac Level 10. 